This is Operation Steel Pike 1, the largest peacetime amphibious landing operation ever launched. The time, late fall of 1964. The place, southern Spain. A landing force of 28,000 men of the U.S. Fleet Marine Force Atlantic and a Spanish Marine Battalion stormed the shore on these beaches to demonstrate our ability to come to the aid of an ally by moving a large assault force overseas into a critical area and by sustaining it there. The operation really began at U.S. home bases along the Atlantic seaboard. All the materials necessary to wage a simulated war, trucks, tanks, medical supplies, rations, and men are loaded aboard Navy and merchant ships for movement to the landing beaches. Assault troops from the 2nd Marine Division and Force Troops Atlantic board ships at East Coast ports. In last minute preparations, troops and equipment are ferried to the assault ships by helicopter. Their next stop, Spain. Farewells are an occupational hazard peculiar and acceptable to the service way of life. At sea, training and preparations continue. With some 60,000 men and 94 United States and Spanish ships participating, the operation requires the coordinated efforts of hundreds of individual specialists and a score of Navy and Marine activities and liaison officers from Spain. Well-formulated plans can still be changed, even up until the hour of the landings, to cope with unfamiliar terrain at the landing site, winds, tides, and unpredictable weather.
The complexity of the exercise demands know-how and techniques learned the hard way in Normandy on a hundred bloody Pacific beaches and in Korea. The stage is set for Steel Pike One, putting into practice lessons learned over 25 years of amphibious warfare. Meanwhile, on the beach at Almeria, by the shore of the Mediterranean, Marine Corps tacticians and engineers have joined Navy Seabees in establishing a short airfield for tactical support, to provide close-in aerial support for the landing force, known as SATs. It permits jet aircraft to land and take off on strips less than 4,000 feet in length. It is, in effect, an aircraft carrier deck moved ashore, complete with a resting gear, and it frees tactical aircraft from dependence on established airfields. Now the assault is underway. Marines in full battle dress go over the side into landing craft. Others prepare for another means of assault, vertical envelopment, a tactic in which assault troops are landed by helicopter behind the enemy during an attack over the beach. An uninvited guest, a Russian ship, observes the activity. Also on hand to view the landings are invited guests, military and civilian leaders of the United States and Spain. Including Senator Richard B. Russell of Georgia, and Representative L. Mendel Rivers of South Carolina. And now, the beach and the challenge to gain a foothold, room to fight, free from reliance upon local sources of supply or the need to have pre-positioned equipment, the assault forces land and move rapidly inland. One hundred marine helicopters from the amphibious assault ships USS Okinawa, Boxer, and Guadalcanal land combat troops at strategic areas behind the enemy's lines. Resistance is strong, and the call goes out for an air strike. An amphibious landing, even a simulated one, is a hazardous business. And during the course of the exercise, 14 Americans lost their lives in two aircraft accidents and at sea. As unfortunate as these deaths are, they do serve to underscore the seriousness of the operation and the vital importance of training for modern amphibious war. And the landings continue. Supplies, equipment, and men pour across the beaches. The buildup is heavy and constant.
helicopters unload a variety of equipment from the carriers. And place it ashore, exactly where it is needed, when it is needed. pronged attack, a direct assault over the beaches, and a helicopter drop in the rear, compels the enemy to disperse his forces, to divide his strength, and multiplies the amphibious forces' chances for success. With the beachhead secured, equipment, supplies, and men now move inland over the longest causeway ever built by the Atlantic fleet. Constructed by Navy Seabees, the 1,260-foot seaborne highway enabled 35 shiploads of material to be smoothly landed despite the absence of anything resembling normal docking facilities. Five days after the initial landing, Operation Steel Pike 1 is finished. Its objectives have been achieved, and combat training has been demonstrated and perfected. The days of push-button warfare, however, are still in the future. The man with the rifle, who must eventually settle all wars, still carries the burden of battle. These men with their rifles, and the Navy men who brought them there and supplied them, return home with the sure knowledge that when the chips are down, the sea power of the United States stands ready and able to reinforce our allies at any time, wherever they may be.